I want to welcome everybody, and particularly want you to welcome our, our uh, speaker today, our guest, Ron Becker from the University of Toronto. He asked me not to make a lengthy introduction, so I will not. <laughs> Just say a couple of things that we're very privileged to have somebody who's so prominent in human computer interaction, and particularly somebody who's now applying that in a field of greater constructive carnage known, applying technology for those who are aging. He uh, got his degrees from a place called MI. Tea? Yeah, I've something like that. Uh, yeah. And uh, what you probably don't know is that we went to the same high school. <laughs> Not quite the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, thanks very much, Oz. Thanks uh, to Brad for initiated the invitation and the Robotics Institute for sponsoring the talk. And it's a great pleasure to be here. When I went to that MIT, Carnegie Mellon was not Carnegie Mellon, it was Carnegie Institute of Technology and things have certainly come a long way. Um, I'm going to talk to you today really about the work of my lab, the Technologies for Aging Gracefully Lab, uh, technology in support of graceful aging. If you want to walk away with a handout as a reminder, here's some very lovely postcards and just to put in a plug, we're always looking for bright graduate students and postdocs to, to come work with us. So uh, please contact me if what I do today gets you interested. Uh, the good news is we're living a lot longer the staggering piece of data is some United Nations data that I read a couple years ago that said that in the year 2000, one-fifth of the world population was over 60, and by the year 2150, should the world live that long, uh, one-third of the world's population will be over 60. So in some sense, imagine looking to the right of you, looking to the left of you, and one out of every three of you would be over 60. This is going to be a very different world. Uh, the bad news is that in order for us to live longer, um, uh, and assuming they're not major advances in medicine uh, between now and then, we're going to be coping with an increasing variety of cognitive, sensory, motor, uh, and other uh, impairments and disabilities. Uh, most people working in the field uh, come to this from the fields of artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning, and their goal is to make machines smarter so they can better help seniors. Our goal is to develop technology to make seniors and their families smarter, more independent, more resourceful. One of the great pleasures of being here at CMU is that I've never been in a building that so combines the fields of AI and robotics and HCI uh, to do really interesting research of this kind. So again, it's a pleasure to be here because of that. Who are we? Well, we're about 20 research students and staff, and we work with, you saw a whole list of names on the beginning, we work with a number of research collaborators from clinical and other uh, disciplines, and I mentioned some of the fields in one of my last slides. Uh, our method is to invite, someone asked me today, what technology do you focus on? You know, is it X or is it Y? And I said, well, we're, we're really pretty dilettante-ish. We look around at what we identify as sweet spots where we think some technology is ready to assist some human needs, try to envision ways in which technology could solve those problems, design and test and improve the solutions, while always trying to do our work grounding it in intensive field research. My students have a great burden compared to other students in HCI at the University of Toronto, and most of them cannot bring 20 undergraduates into a lab and run them for an hour testing out a new laser pointer technique and write it out and get P less than a result with P less than 0 .001 and send it to Kai and get it published with almost 90% accuracy. They have to work in the field field in often very, very intensively difficult situations. Because we're working with people with Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment, we work with stroke survivors, people with MS, and some of the other um, areas that you see on the slide. And we also work with a class of people called normally aging senior citizens. 
Uh, one of the reasons that we can be uh, relatively successful and, and, and creative is because I'm not the only person in computer science at the University of Toronto who does HCI research and you see our cast of characters there, Raven, Kai and Daniel, and so we have not as many people working in HCI as CMU, which is sort of off the scale, but uh, a good collection of students for uh, people to interact with. Our mantra is research for the journey through life. And so we approach things uh, from a number of points of view. When I started this work about 10 years ago, uh, I thought that the goal was to develop prosthetics to aid cognition for individuals, sort of the equivalent of the mental equivalent of a crutch. The way a crutch helps you if you break your leg, uh, helps you get around and support yourself even though your leg cannot hold any work. Wait, uh, we've now realized over the last decade as we've gotten more and more into this that uh, first of all, the problem is not just one of cognition. It's cognition, communication, uh, identity, feelings of self-worth, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, it's not just about prosthetics. Uh, we're also interested in rehabilitation. So again, going back to the example of breaking your leg, after you know, uh, you're know you almost through using the crutch, you'll go to a physiotherapist who will help you regain strength in the leg. And so we're interested in rehab, and ultimately we're interested in to what extent some of these technology or some of these interventions uh, can prevent certain kinds of decline. The one that's gotten the most interest in the uh, marketplace now is uh, uh, games for mental, to prevent mental aging, brain fitness games, and I'll talk about my assessment of that field and what our research response to that has been. Um, and then finally, uh, we've realized that this is not just about helping the individuals themselves, but helping them and their family members and caregivers and clinicians. So it's a much harder problem than just building a crutch for the mind. We have three major themes in our work, identity, autonomy, and family and community. And these emerge sort of spontaneously. And in thinking about how to justify them or fit them into some framework, I stumbled across something called the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, and in fact, I should just do a poll. How many of you here are undergraduates? Raise one hand. OK, not too many. OK. How many of you are here graduate students? Okay, most of you, and I assume the rest, most of the rest are research staff, or uh, how many are not primarily at Carnegie Mellon now and are just in from the outside world? Okay, a, a few of you, good. Uh, how many of you primarily come from sort of a computer science or robotics or technical background? Okay, how many of you come from some kind of medical background or psychology or, or something like that? I know those are very different. Um, uh, occupy, uh, uh, health, allied health sciences, anyone from nursing or PT or OT or anything like that? Okay, uh, all right. So what Maslow did, and this was a paper in the 1940s, he said uh, uh, humans have five kinds of needs at the lowest level, in some sense, physiological needs, needs for safety and security, need for love, needs for self-esteem, and needs for self-actualization. And to describe that in a little more detail, physiological needs are sort of obvious, things like oxygen, food, water, being warm enough, staying fit and healthy. Safety need is, again, is fairly obvious. Um, we in computer science don't have a lot of solutions to the need for love, but um, the way we've interpreted that is uh, trying to build technology that strengthens or maintains one's connections to family and friends and community. Esteem is a very rich area. And as I said before, our goal is to try to uh, allow seniors to remain as autonomous as possible, to let them do meaningful things that have made a difference in their life in the past and to continue to do that even if their hearing gets a little worse or their vision gets a little worse or they can move a little more slowly. The hardest to define is self-actualization, the need for a cause or a calling or fulfillment. Uh, some people think of that as religion. We don't do a lot in that score in my lab, but we focused particularly on the problem of helping 
people, uh, particularly with Alzheimer's and mild cognitive in, in, uh, uh, impairment, maintain a sense of identity or at least remember what their life was like before dementia uh, set in. Uh, so what I want to do is start with physiological needs uh, and um, I'm just looking at the time here, okay, and safety needs and there's just going to be a couple slides about each because the reason there's a little gap there between that and love needs is we're not really working in the first two areas. But I just want to give you a feeling for a couple of the things that are going on and then I'll move to the bottom part of the slide and talk about the specific projects that we're doing. Um, one of the really big areas now in terms of keeping people healthy is the rapidly growing field of health websites. And you see here, I just randomly took a, a condition that often affects uh, um, senior males, prostate gland, gland enlargement. And you can see here little snapshots from a health website that's um, done by the government, PubMed Med Health, from a very reputable private clinic, the Mayo Clinic, and from a commercial website, WebMD which I think was the noted entrepreneur Jim Clark's third or fourth or fifth startup. Um, another area that uh, there's increasing activity in terms of staying healthy is uh, the commercial success of the Nintendo product Wii. How many of you here have Wii in your home or know someone who's got Wii in your home? Okay. And uh, this has taken off very rapidly or very significantly in a lot of senior communities. And you see a variety here, including things like Wii bowling and, and things like that. And particularly when this can be done in a social environment, this is very interesting. And I saw, I can't tell you how many offices I went to today when somebody had packages of Microsoft Connects on the floor ready to be unpacked. And I think the Microsoft Connect uh, is going to lead to all sorts of opportunities there. Um, so just to, again, engage you a little bit, uh, uh, for those of you who look at the web before you go see your doctor, I'm curious, uh, raise one hand if this you feel this has improved your relationship with your physician. Please raise a hand. Okay, and how many of you feel that it's led to new challenges and it hasn't necessarily improved your relationship with your physician? Okay, so that's about 50-50, although it, it looks like a not a lot and not a lot of you yet are, are using this, maybe because most of you are so young. Um, okay, uh, I now want to move to safety needs and I'm just going to have one slide here. And in fact, uh, this represents three pieces of work that I think are extraordinary. The upper left is work from CMS you, Howard Wachtler, and this is a block diagram or floor diagram of an automation of a, uh, I guess, a nursing home with lots of video cameras around in order to, uh, in order to detect automatically people with dementia wandering at night, which could be a very dangerous situation. On the right, you see some images from a brilliant young researcher at the University of Washington named Shwetak Patel, who has developed some electronics that either uh, attaches directly to the circuitry of your house or indirectly through transducers to the fluid flow system and can be used for uh, a computer to detect, oh, well, it looks like normally uh, there's a lot of electric, electrical activity between 9 and 10 in the morning in the kitchen, which somebody could interpret as turning on a toaster and a coffee pot. And this hasn't happened for two days, so maybe there's a cause for alarm. And the last images at the bottom are from another brilliant young researcher, and this time in, in Toronto, and then Alex Michalaitis on fall detection. There's a technology that um, many of you may have heard of or seen TV ads or maybe you have uh, someone in your family who uses it, uses it, the ad goes, I've fallen and I can't get up, where you press something. And what Alex is working on is some computer vision uh, algorithms with a camera in the ceiling that could notice through some edge detection, silhouette detection, as you see at the bottom, that there's some sort of strange shape next to the bed, which, because again, it's unusual, might represent someone having fallen. So again, and, and where I do this talk again and could spend more time here, I would probably have some more examples of some of the work going on here. Um, okay, so now I want to go into our work. 
And um, the, uh, so I've got a question for you. How many of you know at least one person who you would say is socially isolated and presumably lonely? Okay, please raise one hand. Okay, that's, uh, that's about a third of you. That's, that's fairly typical, okay? So we're interested, what you see here is an image of uh, uh, people Skyping with one another, me and my wife, and Skype is great if you're technologically reasonably sophisticated, and I know a number of grandparents who Skype with their grandchildren at a moment's notice, or Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, or whatever, but we're interested in another kind of population. These are populations of people who are isolated and could very probably be lonely because of the isolation. This includes some, but not all, seniors living alone, seniors in long-term care, uh, 724 homebound caregivers taking care of other seniors, people in long-term hospitalization, rehab, chemo. There are a whole variety of conditions which lead to this. My uh, my feeling is there are probably several tens of millions of individuals in North America in this condition. So these people live alone or with a single partner partner, uh, their social networks have probably shrunk significantly. Perhaps they've moved away from their home of origin. They've retired to Florida and uh, they don't have anyone with them anymore. They might have sensory or motor impairments which uh, interact with their isolation and they often have little control over they feel how they feel at a particular time and when they're available for social contact. So in order to help us design for this kind of population better, we recently finished a interview study with people with chronic pain, persistent and prolonged pain that lasts at least three months. Um, this is a far greater problem than I first anticipated. We work with Diane Gramala at Simon Fraser University who studies this and she assured us that this applied to between 25 and 30 percent of, of uh, community developing seniors in Canada. That now that's community developing, uh, community dwelling. It could be even more for people who are in institutionalized and uh, so we did an interview study with it says here 30 it actually wound up 27 asking how the chronic pain affects their social interactions and their needs for social interaction and the results which we're reporting at CSAW 2012 in Seattle in February is that the intermittent variability of chronic pain the fact that you didn't know from one moment to the next whether you're going to be in chronic pain or you're going to feel fine and you can predict it made it very hard hard for people to schedule social interactions, to participate um, in outward activities, and that a lot of the technologies that people used, including the telephone and computers, uh, had form factor and ergonomic and accessibility challenges for these people that made it difficult for them uh, to use. And that, uh, in fact, asynchronous contact, the ability to send a message out and then get a message back sometime later, uh, might be very appropriate for these kinds of individuals. And so we've built two models of this. It's called the Families in Touch electronic uh, frame. Uh, you see the first model in the upper left and the current model here. And I'm going to try to see if the audio is loud enough on this. Um, uh, and if not, I'll go out of this and play it. Um, um, actually, I think I'll just go out of it and play it separately because I know this one is very low. Okay, what do I say space now to get this? Is that, somebody told me how to do this, okay. So there's a senior citizen pressing this and a message goes out to close family saying, I'm thinking of you. Hey Grandpa, just got a request. It's really beautiful here in Toronto and it's becoming fall. Dad wants to send you a video of the dog later, so hopefully you get that. Talk to you later, bye. That's Jessica. And so very shortly thereafter, you get mail on this picture frame. And then a little later. OK, 
Okay. So um, we're pleased with the progress of this project so far, although we barely started. What uh, Jessica is currently doing is doing a diary study of individuals in chronic pain in order to understand a little more the fine structure of how their days go and how the pain affects their ability and need to communicate with family. Uh, we're testing model two, the one you saw, and Allison, what Allison Benjamin is doing is now doing an interview study with people who we think could use the same kind of technology but are in a very different situation. They're not living at home, they're in long-term care or long-term hospitalization. And those two populations, uh, by long-term care, I mean a nursing home, they use a slightly different language in Canada, and, uh, and that's a different population. And we have all sorts of new technology ideas for making this uh, technology more interesting and the goal is to avoid feature creep and to keep it very, very simple. We're also looking at uh, not just using picture frames, but bringing this kind of messaging uh, medium and ability in through television rather than the picture frames because TV is so ubiquitous, for example, in hospital situations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, uh, so now let me shift gears and this is uh, I'm going to go very rapidly through five different projects. This is the next one, keeping mentally fit. So how many of you here have, have used Nintendo's Brain Age? Okay, and keep your hands. Do you like it or do you, you like it? Okay, all right, good. All right, so uh, there's a huge industry now in the brain fitness, brain fitness game uh, area. It was a quarter of a billion dollar market in 2008. It's been projected to grow to $5 billion by 2015. You see here some of the ads from, uh, from companies in the space. Brain fitness for life. Train your brain in minutes a day, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what's the evidence that this really works? Okay, there's a lot of evidence now that says that, uh, and it, it's, it goes under the name neuroplasticity. There's a lot of research in the world of neuroplasticity that says that the brain can adapt from insults, from, from damage in ways that we didn't think possible 20 and 30 or 40 years ago. I just visited, I heard the story, I, I visited another university on the way and was told about a professor who had had severe brain damage and now has managed to come back even though the prognosis was, 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 was very severe. And there are lots of other examples of people, of people essentially healing themselves. There's a concept called cognitive reserve out there which is most associated with a name, Professor Jakob Stern, who's a professor of cognitive neuropsychology at Columbia Medical School. And the idea of cognitive reserve is that if you take large numbers of people with identical, more or less, brain scans in the sense that they have equivalent amounts of plaques and tangles, the neurological damage that often manifests itself as Alzheimer's disease, and you match them up, and in some cases you have people who seem to have Alzheimer's Alzheimer's disease and some people who seem perfectly normal and you ask why, it becomes clear that over a lifetime, if you've been to Harvard or Yale or CMU, you're better able to withstand the neurological damage than if you've been, a, you only have a high school education. If you've been a computer scientist or a graphic designer, you're better able to withstand neurological damage than if you've been a ditch digger. If you've exercised a lot, you're better, you're better able than if you're a couch potato. If you've eaten the Mediterranean diet, you're better off than eating McDonald's. If you've had a lot of friends, you're better off than being a hermit. If you've had a bilingual education early in life, that's helped you over just a unilingual education, and that's a big issue in Canada because of the importance of both English and French. Uh, but these are experiences that you have over a lifetime. Okay, and uh, most of the studies, or many of the studies, do not disen do not sufficiently disentangle the effects of recent activities from lifelong activities. Most of the studies, with a couple exceptions that I mentioned there, do not evaluate medium-term impacts. What you typically will see is a study that says, okay, we had people do this brain fitness game for six weeks, and then we measured their performance on a certain number of tests uh, for six weeks after that, and they got better. 
Okay, but what happens three months later, six months later, and also in many cases, uh, people start doing something regularly, like they start doing Sudokus regularly, okay? It doesn't have to be a brain fitness game. Yes, you get better at Sudoku, but does that help you do better on the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle, or, or in forgetting, uh, or in not forgetting to turn off the stove, or in navigating in a, in a different environment? So we need lots more prospective research studies. So what we've done in our lab, rather than building yet another brain fitness game, uh, is we've been developing a portal to make it easier for brain fitness researchers and in fact other researchers to do studies of the effectiveness of interventions over the internet. Uh, this was Velian Pandaleev's master's thesis. It's called Tangra. Tangra is the proto-Bulgarian proto god of wisdom and thunder. Uh, Velian's of Bulgarian ancestry. I thought wisdom and thunder was a nice uh, juxtaposition. And he's done a pilot test of Tangra comparing two mental fitness games to two traditional board games. And what he found was that, in fact, we can recruit participants over the internet. We can screen, validate their identity, and get informed content. We can ensure security and privacy. We can avoid confounds as well as face-to-face -face study. What's a confound? A confound is, I mean, the way Yaakov Stern has to do studies right now is he brings people, he schleps people who come in for, over the subway from all over New York three times a week to sit there and do these games for an hour and a half a day, three times a week, 13 weeks. Um, what do they do between the games? So we can monitor that as well if people are working in their homes as we can when they come into the lab. Uh, we think we can motivate retention and adherence and people staying in the studies. Our, our retention rate wasn't too great in the study, but we noticed that in a few cases, Velian interacted with his participants via Skype. And so we've now built in a desktop video conferencing facility right into the experimental framework so that our so that a participant can occasionally say, hi, I, I'm sorry, a, a, a researcher can say, hi, participant number 17, how you doing? Okay, and we believe that will increase uh, adherence. Uh, our next step is to allow us to study mobile apps, and we're thinking of releasing this open source and looking for a community of collaborators, because ultimately to make this a real project, we need a lot of help. Next project. Okay, how many of you know a stroke survivor who has little ability, ability to speak and reduced engagement with life because of that? Raise a hand. Okay, that's not so many. Good. Okay. So uh, this is a problem we started looking at a few years ago. Uh, we started out with a, a project called Friend Forecaster. And the idea of Friend Forecaster was that since your cell phone knew where you were, uh, if it knew something about your social network and you were bothered by an increasing inability to forget an increasing ability to remember, remember names, a decreasing ability to remember names, it would suggest names of people that you might plausibly encounter at CMU. So I, I actually put a few names on this, and I've got Sarah Kiesler's name on, and a couple of Brad Myers people I thought I might run into here. Uh, and so Alex Levy and I sat around a couple years ago after Kent Fenwick, who did Friend Forecaster, graduated with his master's degree, and we said, well, what what should we do next? And we said, let's generalize this from names to arbitrary vocabulary. And so the idea is that what my voice does is it allows you to access vocabulary in a very elegant way. It's a lovely, lovely interface. You can download it from the uh, you can download it from the iPhone App Store, or from the Android Store. Store. Uh, it allows you to org access words either in semantic categories or in chunks based on plausible use based on your location. So if you're in front of a Starbucks, it comes up with one set of words. And if you're in front of a movie theater, it comes up with another set of words. Now, that's not to say that you might not talk about your favorite movie in Starbucks or that you might not get a cup of coffee in a movie theater. But still, if you have trouble finding words and you're going into Starbucks, you are very likely to need things like calf, 
decaf, double double, um, cappuccino, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've built this. Uh, it's it's a lovely interface. Uh, it integrates text, images, and very human sounding speech, uh, and uh, works on a couple of platforms. And let me show you a video done recently by a local TV channel that gives you a, a feeling for it. And uh, let me again go out of this to make sure that the audio is okay. Uh, and I have much to on the subway on the way to work. Mm -hmm. I was reading books, but when I got to the stop where I was supposed to get off. What the human brain cannot express. <coughs> After my stroke, it was difficult for me to understand why I couldn't communicate. Bill Scott's iPhone can. Nice to meet you, Mr. Keith. The My Voice app is giving voice to the voiceless. It's the brainchild of these University of Toronto students. It's great to be able to tell you about My Voice. Common words and phrases can be programmed into the app. And these are very expressive voices. They can do things like <laughs> laugh, <laughs> cough. The second way that they can use it is they can take these words and phrases and associate them with physical places. Getting started is very simple. All you have to do is input the address of a location you frequent regularly. And once you find the location, you can start inputting the phrases you would use there. Geolocation technology will then detect when you're close by and automatically call up the vocabulary you use. Hello. Please withdraw $20. At a recent book signing, film critic Roger Ebert himself robbed of speech because of cancer lauded the technology. What are your thoughts on this idea? The addition of GPS is brilliant. For Bill Scott, my voice has meant freedom and confidence. It's really socially acceptable. Lots of people have iPhones. And all of these. <laughs> it's like you're always a tourist. That's good. Cool. Before my voice, Bill lugged around this heavy briefcase full of maps and illustrated books just to communicate. You basically went from all of this to this. <laughs> the change has made life a lot sweeter. Future versions of this software will automatically populate the vocabulary list for users based on where they are in the city, basically doing half the work for them. On Willow Street, Peter Kim, City News. Okay, so um, one of the, I won't go into a lot more detail about this, but one of the interesting idea is the notion of having vocabulary books, which right now the My Voice team has built themselves, but we're hoping that we can develop sort of a crowdsourcing notion where individuals who are using My Voice will contribute new books and this will, uh, and this will speed the, uh, the development of this technology. So uh, to what extent have we, have we tested this? Well, we finished some field testing with special needs high school students. We did uh, studies this summer with two uh, I'm sorry, last spring and into the early summer with two children from two schools, um, ages 12 to 14, about a dozen students in each, uh, using it in one case for three months, in one case for one month, and uh, discovered increases in the ability for students to learn vocabulary, more collaborative problem solving, increased confidence, social exchange, socially appropriate discussion, and even a breaking of some of the barriers between students who were more competent and uh, less impaired and students who were at the opposite extent because the technology helped uh, reduce the barriers. We're now uh, doing a much more difficult study with some adults with aphasia, uh, some of whom have stroke or stroke survivors, some of whom have more complex conditions, and uh, evaluating the success of the technology as judged by the individuals themselves, their family members, caregivers, and clinicians. We're working on lots of other uh, technical challenges, including the automatic generation of vocabularies. Uh, in other words, vocabulary that's appropriate for certain conditions. Right now, it's entered by hand. We believe we know how to do it automatically quite well, generating not just words, but phrases and sentences. Uh, and the other thing that started is 
uh, a research project on looking at the same kind of technology, but not for a clinical population, but for normal citizens who have trouble with a second language or yuppie seniors like me who go uh, in foreign travel. And the idea is to build something like my voice that says, okay, uh, uh, you're in a seafood restaurant in Bordeaux, and here's some names of seafood uh, in French uh, to help you, you're, you know, that you only know English and you don't. And uh, this is an actual experience that happened to me where the phrase book and the dictionary were totally useless, uh, but my voice or something like that. And this is Carrie Demonzep's PhD thesis in its early stages. Uh, okay, another question for you. How many know someone uh, who has now, who used to read a lot, but now has trouble reading, either because they're blind or their vision is very poor, or they can't hold the book, or they can't turn the pages, or maybe they've, they're starting to develop Alzheimer's and they're finding it harder to concentrate and remember things? Raise one hand if you know somebody like this. Okay, that's, uh, it's funny, every audience is different. The, uh, I, I spoke to an audience recently where almost half the people raised their hand on that one. Okay, so that's the next situation that we're working on. Uh, and it's called the Accessible Large Print Listening and Talking eBook, ALT. Uh, and the idea, the original idea was very simple. And again, it started by looking at the iPad and saying, wow, look at what you can do. And is there something that we can use, uh, something that we can can do that make it ap applicable to seniors in certain conditions or special needs populations. And sort of the, the two obvious things that came to mind immediately is that we could unify the concept of a large print book with the concept of a talking book. Both large print books and talking books are far more ubiquitous than Braille. Actually, very few people actually use Braille because it's so, and so difficult. And that was sort of obvious. And in fact, on an iPad, you can, imp you can enlarge the type and uh, you can also get it read aloud with a, a not too uh, uh, good sounding voice. But what we said is, can we go beyond that? And the two key ideas are the accessibility idea and what you could do if the book not only will speak the words to you, but will listen to you as you read aloud. So in terms of accessibility, what we've done is we realized that this didn't just apply to people with vision loss, but it, for example, also applied to people with MS, who because of hand tremor or because of the fact that their muscles were shrinking in could no longer hold, 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 hold the book. This could have made a big difference to the life of my sister who grew up in Pittsburgh and passed away from MS a couple years ago. Uh, and so uh, the gestural interface on the iPad is sexy and it's wonderful, but it's not for everybody. So we've now started to build keyboard interfaces to the same application and we're also looking at voice input as well. Uh, the idea of having the book listen to you while you're talking is even more interesting. So you see in the image on the upper right, you see a, 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 pink, bound, a, pink, a pink border, and that means that uh, someone is reading aloud and the, and the uh, machine is recording your voice. And the use model, we originally thought of this, and this was Xavier's idea, the brilliant undergraduate who built this first. And Xavier, when we started talking about this, he said, you know, I've been reading to my grandmother for a year, for years, and she was uh, she loved to read. She was a very educated woman, and she was then almost 80, and it was getting harder and harder for her to read. And now, in fact, she's totally blind. And he would read to her, but when he read to her, it would be gone. And so, what happens if you're reading with Alt? It will uh, take your voice and synchronize it to the text. And then, if you want to then continue reading on your own, or if you can't see it all, having the the book read aloud to you. It will read the portions that your family member read to you in, in the family member's voice, but then switch over to a synthetic voice for the rest of it. And so we're now testing this with an individual with MS living with their family. And this, uh, so far, the testing is going very well. And what's happened is that, in fact, it's led us to realize that we, that, and again, and we always discover when we go out and test these things in the real world, that there are all sorts of things we didn't think of. And in this case, the woman will call, I'll call Trudy. It turns out she and her family are not just using it for one of her parents to read to her, but she's reading herself. And this is reinforcing her love of reading. And she hasn't read for about 10 years prior 
to this, and this is getting her into reading again, and we believe will have significant impact. And so this is, this is a wonderful project. We have all sorts of technical challenges as well as uh, challenges in terms of who this might be used for, people with MS, Parkinson's, or even dementia. And Valian Pandaleev is now starting a, ma a PhD thesis looking at this area and is looking at cognitive challenges, which may be inability to remember things or to recall where you are, as well as we're very interested again in the notion of reading in a second language and what the opportunities there are. We've also now interfaced this through uh, conversations with Brewster Kale of the Internet Archive. We can now download close to a million books out of copyright uh, through the uh, Internet Archive, and we're going to do the same thing to Google Books soon. My last question for you, how many of you know someone with Alzheimer's disease and to what extent, and this is too complicated a question, okay, uh, to what extent is there, for, okay, first of all, how many know relatively close someone with Alzheimer's disease, okay, and is there, is their personality and the person they are still being preserved through it, or is it is it sort of fading away in some sense as the dementia gets gets deeper? I see you shaking your head, so I assume you're you're saying it's fading away, or yeah, fading away. Okay, so we can't do anything to prevent that, but um, but we think we can build media artifacts that help people and family members sort of recall and reminisce and re-experience the way they were. This is a project that started with another collaborator, Elsa Marziali, who's an endowed chair in social work at Baycrest, and the idea was to create digital life histories to aid individuals with Alzheimer's to uh, reminisce and to recall and in some sense to re-experience what their life was like before the Alzheimer's or the dementia set in. And we've been working not only with Alzheimer's but mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is a set of, of syndromes that if you're diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, the odds are 50-50 you'll be diagnosed with Alzheimer's within four years. And so what we did, and this was a, a, a long process, is we worked with 12 participants ages 60 to 94, half with MCI, half with Alzheimer's disease. Together, in many cases with family members, we planned, designed, and created um, a video biography of their life, typically 30 to 50 minutes long. Uh, in most cases, the author, it was a biography, it was a family member who worked with us to decide what the story was and to plan and write the script. In four cases with MCI, it became an autobiography in which the individuals themselves wrote their own story of their life. And then we showed this, sort of the world premiere to these individuals and sometimes families, asked that it be viewed regularly over six months and came back at T equals three months and T equals six months, showed the biography again, videotaped that, recorded the responses, interviewed family and caregivers, transcribed everything and did qualitative analysis and hierarchical open coding in order to get some meaning out of it. And what we discovered is that yes, it stimulated reminiscence. People could, as the example there, soak up memories and, and re-feel what it was like uh, for some scene that was shown in the video. It typically was perceived with enjoyment, although sometimes there was sadness, and this is an issue of some debate in the field about the extent one should should do reminiscence therapy with real life experiences about the individual or just uh, the story of, of, of the town you grew up in. And we now have some evidence that says that in these video screenings, we recorded 15 to 20 times as many incidents of happiness and joy than we did someone wiping, wiping a tear away because they could see someone who had passed away. Let me give you a sense of this with two examples. I think I, I, this will uh, play loud enough in in PowerPoint. Oh. Okay, so it 
not only helps you remember names and places and facts, uh, but it remembers, helps you re-experience feelings. It was very good to uh, go there, to live there. But what we discovered that was very interesting was that it was in viewing these with family members that the richness of this, these media artifacts became out. So here you see Ms. Zed watching the story of her life with her daughter, and you hear her daughter speaking with her mom during this, but she's also the narrator of the, of the video. This is you in one of brown suits. Really stunning suit. What a castle of terrain on your device. It's very important. You are looking so beautiful. So later on, this appears. There was a very rough cut in the, early in that when she starts to laugh at Catherine Hepburn, she actually keeps laughing for about 10 or 15 seconds, and her daughter has to say, don't choke mom. So this is a very powerful experience for her, and uh, we have a number of examples. I've just shown you the, uh, the clips I have where the interactions with family members are very, very important. Uh, we had budgeted for to, to give a certain number of DVDs to family members. We had to keep manufacturing more and more for different family members, and what we saw in two of the 12 cases that we really hadn't expected at all is that uh, watching this was very important for caregivers as well. So in two of the cases where someone lived in a nursing home, we showed it to the caregivers and then all of a sudden it was not just, okay, this is the woman in the 17th room along this corridor who's one of these 20 women between 80 and 90 uh, who have Alzheimer's and half of whom are Holocaust survivors, but uh, this is the person who grew up in South Africa whose passion was lawn bowling. Okay, and so this was very, very important. So uh, uh, we've published the, the results that uh, the importance of this to helping people reminisce, the prevalence of enjoyment, the role in stimulating conversation, engagement with family, and the role for caregivers. And also, we've shown that uh, the process we developed, and we're finally going to uh, publish a production manual to help others do this, that it's very practical. It doesn't take, it doesn't take uh, uh, a whole Hollywood production crew. I've often imagined that if Scarlett O'Hara ever got old and Rhett Butler decided to come back to her to take care of her when she developed dementia, he could show her Gone with the Wind to, uh, uh, to show her what th that, that was like. So we can't afford Gone with the Wind, but this kind of thing can be done by a high school student as long as uh, there is someone more adult to mediate issues of family conflict around what is the story? What do you include? What do you not include? We've also done and just completed and we're just writing up for publication a more recent project, a very difficult project in which we've used Microsoft SenseCam uh, technology that Matt Lee and others here have, have worked with to help people with uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, or amnesia remember recent experiences to uh, crystallize episodic memories. And in our study, we've compared the uh, effect of watching the raw image stream of SenseCam images with no sound with an edited collection of images with a narrated soundtrack by caregivers, which we call SenseCam Remix, against an act of control. And one other project that I don't have time to talk to you today, but I heartily encourage you to bring Mike Massimi here to give a talk, either uh, through the HCI Institute or whatever. My brilliant doctoral student, Mike Massimi, is finishing a PhD dissertation on what he calls thanatosensitive design. Uh, Thanatos is the Greek god of death, and Mike and others, including uh, there's a fellow here, um, 
I'm, unfortunately, I'm having a senior's moment and blocking his name right now, who's, who's also worked with Mike, uh, who are looking at what issues do we need to think about as people uh, approach the end of life. And the last part of Mike's thesis, which um, uh, he's just in the process of writing up, and hopefully he'll defend the whole thesis within a month or two, is the design and evaluation of BSOP, which is bereavement support web portal to support individuals who are grieving the loss of, and he's been working with three groups, uh, parents who've lost a child, um, uh, teenagers, or young people who've lost a peer, and people and families in general who have just lost uh, someone very important to them in their family. So what I've done is I've talked about a huge variety of technologies ranging from websites to the Wii, uh, to mobile apps, to e-books, uh, uh, to deal with a variety of human needs, ranging from understanding our health, to staying physically fit, to staying connected to friends and family, to speaking, to reading, to remembering uh, past experiences or recent experiences and dealing with grief. And uh, there's a huge opportunity here to continue work. And of course, I don't, it, CMU and in this environment, I don't have to sell you on this. What have we learned? We've learned that, as I said at the beginning, it's not just about memory or cognition. It's much broader than that. It's not just about supporting individuals, but supporting entire families and teams of, of caregivers and clinicians. It's highly, highly multidisciplinary, involving a whole bunch of disciplines listed there. Uh, it, uh, it cannot be done in a laboratory. Uh, we have good ideas, but the ideas we have sitting there in the lab are nothing compared to the ideas that come out uh, when we go out and actually try this in the field. And the example I gave before of seeing Trudy starting to read by herself with the e-book is a good example. We, we just had never thought of that. And, uh, and evaluation is really, really difficult. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, there's all sorts of unforeseen hiccups due to illness and, and, and even worse. And, and it involves uh, very skilled uh, qualitative research. And uh, um, you know, again, if um, just to put in the plug again, we're always looking for grad students and postdocs who, uh, who have these kinds of skills. Uh, why am I doing this, just to wrap up? Well, uh, I'm having a lot of fun. This, in a way, this is the culmination of a long and diverse career. I hope to do it. I'm 69. I hope to do it to age 99. I figure asking for three digits is presumptuous, so that's my goal, 99. But my feeling is that, I mean, there are lots of things you could do to make the world a better place. Bill Gates believes that uh, helping the world combat diseases all around the world that, that uh, uh, reduces the probability that children can, lead, can, can live to adulthood. That's very valuable. There are a lot of people interested in how can we work against natural disasters like floods and hurricanes and things like that. Uh, I think that even though we're not all going to be a Vladimir Horowitz or a Pablo Casals or, or a Picasso or a Nelson Mandela, that there are huge opportunities for seniors who often sort of don't know what to do with themselves when they retire. And it may be that if they're surrounded by a dozen grandchildren close by, they don't have a problem. But that doesn't apply to a lot of people. And so we can increase. Uh, the goodness and creativity and productivity of the world by making seniors productive longer. And that's what I think some of these activities are all about and also what some of the work being done here is all about. So thank you for your attention. And I can stay all night to answer questions. I'm not sure this room will stay open all night, but thank you. And I can repeat questions if do you think uh, you, you signal me if you think someone wasn't loud enough to be picked up by your camera. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know who. Yes, please. Uh, very interesting. Uh, since we do robotics here, I have a question. Uh, what's your opinion of robotic toys, robotic pets, robotic companions, perhaps mobile robots that can run around the house? 
Um, I, I haven't personally been that enthused, but in all honesty, I haven't lived with them or experienced them. And several people here have spoken that, uh, I forget the name of the Japanese robot that's, I don't know, is it shaped like a penguin or what's it shaped like, that uh, they've had some very encouraging results and I've seen some pretty cute robots around here. So I'm, I'm you know, I have an open mind. We, it's not the kind of work we do. Uh, at uh, Toronto, we don't have the environment you have here where, uh, you know, we in HCI, some people in the department, I think, think we're a little weird. And so we don't work together as much with AI and robotics and vision with HCI as you do here. So, uh, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. I, uh, I've met, as I said, I've met several people here. I wouldn't try to remember their names publicly, but uh, uh, that are doing some very excited work. I think there's opportunities for both. It's not the work we do. Our goal is to try to get the individuals, the human beings themselves, to do more themselves where possible. And uh, I, think, I think we need both kinds of, of research. And again, because you have HCI so close with robotics, you know, that's a really great environment. So, yeah. It yeah. sounds very easy and doable, but how much does, uh, how much of a toll does it take on the family to go back and rehash these memories? Like um, we. The question is, how much does making the multimedia biography take a toll on the family? Um, we had no cases, I believe. We had a couple people drop out due to illness or in one case someone passing away. Uh, but of the 12 that really got into it, nobody dropped out because of that. We had one very touching situation where the individual was about to start his autobiography uh, and, uh, and a daughter had passed away uh, two or three months before and he spent some time thinking about how he felt about that in relationship to the video and he but he did include it in there and I believe he felt that that was the right thing so there are some there is some emotional turmoil but we think that uh, um, for for most people or many people if they do this, they will decide it was the right thing. Now, again, as I say, there are people who work in reminiscence therapy who disagree with us about this, but we feel we have evidence that this is good. Elsa and I felt that, uh, you know, dealing with the grief was often important, and so that this was a process where it might rekindle a little bit of grief, but, but uh, you know, it, it was okay, but it's up to every family to judge. There are a few businesses that I've run into in various parts in the states every now and then. Every year somebody writes me and says, oh, I do this in, I don't know, Madison, Wisconsin or whatever, but this is still not an idea that a lot of people are doing. And in theory, it should become a lot easier now that, I mean, the big production bottleneck in doing this, there were two big bottlenecks. It wasn't the nonlinear editing of production at the end. The first, the first bottleneck was deciding on what the story is. And again, sometimes you're in a situation where some family members don't agree on what the story is. And the second bottleneck was gathering the raw materials, going around and looking at shoe boxes for old pictures and things. In theory, this should be easier now that so much is digital. In practice, I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm not sure, sure that finding, you know, if you take pictures now, that 20 years from now, you'll be any, you'll find it easier to find them than you did when you put them in a shoe box. So there are some challenges there. Yes. Uh, you talked about a lot of technologies, but somehow I felt uh, uh, most of them are dependent on use of internet or iPhone or stuff. I mean, for con developing countries, I mean, are there is, is there any ideas uh, uh, that you're pursuing or is being pursued in other parts of the world that are like uh, towards helping people but are independent of devices? Yeah. And um, well, most of our work is using devices of, I'm sorry? Yeah, so the question was, are there developments in developing countries where that, uh, you know, issues of cost uh, might make it impractical to use iPhones or iPads? Um, we're not doing work like that. I don't know of work being done. I mean, my colleague Ravan Balakrishnan is doing now, has an increasing number of students working on technology for use in developing countries. Um, my sense is that as costs go down, this will become less and less of a problem. And that, and that the, you know, that non 
on smartphones that might be used now. And of course, uh, 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 cell phones are as prevalent, or almost as prevalent in many developing countries as they are in, in you know, Western countries, uh, that this will become less and less of a problem. But we're not ourselves working on that. So, yes, back there. Yeah, we are not. The question was, are we doing anything for physical activities? Um, we, we have one project which is called Take Me With You, which is developing a video game, a collaborative video game to get seniors, in particular grandparents, to go out walking and interact with their grandchildren. But other than that, we're, we ourselves are not doing something. But, but uh, there are, uh, I think I heard about something today, a robotic exerciser to get stroke survivors to exercise their arms. Somebody told me, yeah, what was that project called? MIMO. MIMO. MIMO, okay. Yeah, so there, are, there is work here going on in this kind of thing, but we're not ourselves doing that. Um, we're, we're, n we're, not doing, we're not doing work on that, although the, the e-book project is designed so that you don't have to hold the iPad. As long as if you can touch a, a very small number of keys, you can control it. And again, we're, we're soon going to build voice recognition in so you can control it by voice. So, yes? Your construct about this, uh, what was it called, the, the hierarchy? Of the yes. Pyramid. Yeah. Interesting concept. I never heard about that before. Uh, are you doing any of your studies where you're actually trying to address multiple levels in the hierarchy with the same subjects? Okay. The question is studies to address multiple levels of the hierarchy. Yeah, I'd say the the best example, I mean, we're not doing a lot of them, but the best example is the ebook project because there we're not only illustrating the, we're not a, only attacking the esteem layer, in other words, for people who used to read a lot and now find it difficult to read, this is a very important aspect of their self-esteem and their autonomy continuing to read, but also because we focused on reading collaboratively with family members, this deals with the social need as well. And so one thing that, we've, that we've, we know we can do, we don't have it quite working right yet, but I hope we will in a week, is we can, we can attach the iPad to a large, to an HDTV, which means that uh, families can read together with the iPad. And we think, again, that will address sort of the, the, the love channel and the esteem channel. So we do, uh, it's, the, it's the love Love or social interaction, family and friends, that keeps coming in in different projects in various ways. Yes? Um, what are your thoughts on people who don't have family members to put together their movies or read along with them? People, people who truly are isolated either because their family moved away or whatever other issues. Yeah. Question is, what about thought, what are thoughts about people who truly are isolated and don't have family close by or whatever? Well, I think in the same way that volunteers now read, uh, put books on tape uh, um, for blind people, I think that if technologies or things like this become mature, that there could be opportunities for volunteers to help and provide support in this way. Do you see any likelihood of people basically, you know, as they're, as they're aging, like before they hit the point where they're forgetting uh, documenting their life and creating an archive for themselves? Um, I, 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 there are some companies that, that are selling. Yeah, that exact thing. yeah, there are, as I said, there are companies that are starting to help you create the story of your life. Uh, in some way. And I think with uh, digital photography, this is going to become easier. And again, I think it would be, you know, they're, they're, you know, you guys must have, I mean, in this room, there are probably 10 or 15 media savvy people in here or more. You could work your way through school or through graduate school, not that you'd have time in graduate school, by going out and helping people build these multimedia biographies. And they, you know, they don't have to be video. They could be, they could be narrated slideshows. There could be, there could be websites. There could be all sorts of 
of things. And uh, it's an area that we're continuing to want to look at. I don't have a student now, but making, building tools to make it easier for families to do this, even if they're distributed around the world. Yes. Thanks, Ron again.